Hi everyone, it's me, Linda B, and welcome back. So today, I am going to do another reaction video to Thomas Soul. You guys seem to really like Thomas Soul, so I am going to do another reaction video. And again, he's talking about former President Barack Hussein Obama, particularly as it pertains to Barack Obama's presidency. But before we get started, I ask that you kindly remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe to my channel on my way to 20,000 subscribers by the end of April, you guys. Thank you so much for your support. You can also follow me at The Real Linda Bentley on Facebook and Instagram. And you can email me at chat with me, Linda B at gmail.com. Now let's get into it. If you believe that new plants and factories can dot our landscape, that new energy can power our future, that new schools can provide ladders of opportunity to this nation of dreamers, if you believe in a country where everyone gets a fair shot and everyone does their fair share and everyone plays by the same rules, then I need you to vote this November. All right, new plants and factories, new energy, new schools, and a fair shot. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I, I, I wonder if the fair shot includes the taxpayers. But uh, we've had we've had things we've had factories before there was Barack Obama. I'm uh, hard as it, that is to believe, you know. And uh, we we've had less of it since he came in. Okay, Tom. So let's let me ask this question, which is politically incorrect, which makes it all the more important to ask. Some component of the voting public voted for him last time around as an act of national expiation yeah. because it, they felt. And I, I frankly, I can, I could feel it myself. We were all proud. That even those of us who supported the opponent were all felt proud the following day that the United States of America, uh, the Constitution takes slavery into account, the Civil War. But finally, we have a black man as president of the United States. All right, that's perfectly understandable. We under, we know that took place. Four years later, what about the argument? that it is so important for him to get this right, so important as, as a continuation of this national act of expiation and healing and so forth, that in some way it's only right to give him, frankly, more slack than you might- Affirmative action for president. Well, there you go. I suppose that's what it amounts to. I guess you don't buy that one. Well, when you realize that the president of the United States has the lives of 300 million people in his hands, he has the future of Western civilization in his hands. Uh, uh, he has the freedom that has been inherited over the centuries in his hands, and he's already starting to dismantle that. Uh, I really don't think this is a question of any individual, whoever's in the White House, being cut in the slack. The last thing you need to do is cut slack to people who have power over 300 million other people. Tom Sowell this past summer, quote, the America that has flourished for more than two centuries is being quietly but steadily dismantled by the Obama administration, close quote. Now, you note the way the Obama administration has used executive orders to waive provisions in the No Child Left Behind Act and to repeal, your word, the legal requirement that welfare recipients must work. He's the president, Tom. Doesn't he get to make adjustments in this law or that law? Well, he, he didn't, the, the uh, oath that he took uh, of office was that he would faithfully execute the laws. Now, I don't think they, they, they meant to execute in the same way that the mafia means it. Thomas Sowell on Obamacare, quote, Obamacare imposes huge costs on some institutions while the president's waivers exempt other institutions from having to pay those same costs. The law says you've got to do this. And over here, we have the secretary of Health and Human Services granting a waiver to this person or that entity or this waiver is taking place over here. Well, it's legal. Nobody seems to have sued them for that. One of the great problems is that people do not react. I mean, when all is said and done, the Constitution of the United States uh, is a set of words on pieces of paper. The only way that the Constitution can protect us is if we protect the Constitution. 
if, if we rise up and revolt, if we vote out of office, people who violate the Constitution, then, of course, it will mean something. If people can do this, say a few pretty words, and we say, oh, well, uh, then the Constitution will, over time, erode to the point where it will mean absolutely nothing. You guys, I, I do agree with, um, you know, Thomas Sowell on this. He, he made a good point. The only way that we can, the Constitution can be protected is that we protect the Constitution. That's exactly right. And as far as Obamacare is concerned, Obamacare turned out to be very expensive unless you were extremely poor. Um, it it put a heavy burden on a lot of employers, from what I understand, to the point where they made their they reduced their workforce or they made employees part time instead of full time. It's because I believe you had to have a certain number of employees. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. 50 full time employees. You had to have this insurance that was turned out to be very unaffordable. I know people who've had Obama insurance that their insurance went up. I want to say over a thousand dollars a month, like really, really expensive. And someone else, they were paying like it would cost $6,000 a month. And again, I'm going by what others have said to me. I've never had Obamacare or Affordable Care Act insurance. And the deductible was like $1,000 and it would cost $6,000 a month, which is very unaffordable for most people. And it sounded good, you know, the things, the flowery, inspirational messages that Obama gave, but in the end, it turned out not to be good and turned out to be very unaffordable. It'll be nice words on paper, but people with power will just do what they feel like. What about those nine people in black robes who sit in on, on the bench across the street from the United States Capitol? Isn't it the job of the Supreme Court of the United States to defend the Constitution? It is, but they alone can't do it. And more importantly, if Obama gets reelected, he's probably going to have one or maybe two more members to appoint. And from that point on, it will just be a rubber stamp for whatever he chooses to do. To the economy, Tom Sowell, quote, we are not yet Greece, but we are not exempt from the rules of arithmetic that caught up with Greece. We have just a little more time, close quote. Uh, so what's going to go wrong? Let's assume Barack well, Obama, for, for, the, for the moment, let's assume Barack Obama wins re-election. What bad things happen? For one thing, we start running out of money. Just, and that's the problem of Greece. See, the, the secret of the welfare state is you can do almost anything in the short run, juggling money from here to there and so on. But in the long run, the arithmetic uh, can't be ignored. And in the long run, you're going to run out of money, which is what's happened in Greece, which is starting to happen in Spain, uh, and which can happen uh, in the United States. So, so you're an optimist. That is to say... The welfare state, against which you have devoted enormous professional energies over low these several decades now, is about to come to an end one way or the other. That's right. But it makes a difference how, how it comes to an end. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm trying. What, what, what feels different? I mean, look, we have 8 point, 8 point something or other percent unemployment. As a matter of fact, if the same number of people were still in the workforce as were when President Obama took office, the unemployment rate would be 11 percent. The economy is really bad. Yeah. But by historical standards, it's still a wealthy country. Yeah. People can get by. Journalists are already defining this state of affairs as the new normal. So really, four more years of Barack Obama does what to us? We can, we can, we can skate by, Tom. The question is, how long can you skate? Uh, Greece discovered that there, there does come a point where, where, where there is no more money. In Spain, people are already leaving Spain in droves and taking their money out of the, out of the Spanish banks with them. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that you, you can do in the long run and be forced to do is simply print more money. And as they, as they print more money, that is simply a, a hidden form of taxation. I mean, when the Federal Reserve creates money to buy government bonds and keeps the interest rate low in order to make the price of the debt uh, service low. Uh, what that means is that if you have your money put aside in the bank and, 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 and you're getting 1% and the inflation rate is 3%, that means they're taking 2% of your uh, savings uh, every single year. And you know how compound interest is. Right. Uh, and, and even under the current conditions, in a $100 bill, 
1998 would not buy as much as a $20 bill would have bought in 1960. So the, the, the thievery that goes on through inflation is huge. The Republicans, I think, have the notion that because so many people are unemployed and on food stamps, that that is a, is a negative for Obama. Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected in a landslide after ha having uh, an unemployment rate higher than Obama's. The, there was not a single month in the first term of Franklin D. Roosevelt when unemployment was not in double digits. And in a number of months, the unemployment was over 20%. And he, he won the biggest landslide in American history. So there's the people who think that the economy is the key, that you can't win if the unemployment is 8%, forget it. Shortly before the Obama administration took office, the man who would become President Obama's chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, said, quote, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste, close quote. Why do you find that significant? Because it means that the crisis is presenting them with an opportunity to do things they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And that, that, that's how he sees it. And everything that has happened since the uh, new administration indicates that that's how the administration as a whole sees it. So the crisis is providing an opportunity for President Obama and his supporters to do what they would have liked to do, yes. but would otherwise have been unable to Just do. Just as in the case of the New Deal, that the, the, the New Deal is, most of the key people in the New Deal were for big government intervention long before there was a stock market crash. It's just that the stock market crash gave them an opportunity to step in. It's another parallel is that people are talking about all these, high, these highly intelligent people with whom the president has surrounded himself. Uh, in Washington, FDR surrounded himself with highly intelligent people. Yeah, so that is the problem that, you know, government wants to step in and be more involved in people's lives. Because when there's a crisis or something that gives reason or, you know, like with COVID or anything else for the government to step in and say, you have to do this, you have to take this shot, you have to do this, you have to do that. And this particular, you know, interview was, of course, during Obama's first presidency. This is an older interview, as you can clearly see. They're talking about, they're going to be talking about Obama's, you know, if he's elected, if he's reelected. So he's already president at this time of the interview. And Thomas Sowell is speaking on that. And every time you get a lot of government intervention, what you get a lot of is, control, you get censorship, you get a lot of things that you don't want. And big government brings that. And typically Republicans want small government. It's the opposite of the Democrats in that regard. Uh, that is no guarantee of anything except brilliant rationalizations for failure in some cases. All right. Let me push back a little bit, Tom. When President Obama took office, the financial system appeared close to collapse. Serious economists, including our colleague at the Hoover Institution, Robert Barrow, wrote that there was a significant chance of not just recession, but depression. And today we've got a financial system that's functioning. Housing prices are settling rather than crashing. And there seems to be a general consensus that we'll see a recovery within a year to 18 months. So why not take President Obama at his word and simply impute to him the motives that he claims? He came into office, passed a stimulus bill and a raft of other measures because of the financial crisis demanded that he do so, and it seems to have worked. Well, I, I'm not as optimistic in, in, uh, in, in predicting how, how things are going to be wonderful in, in a couple of years, but we'll know more in a couple of years. Uh, if you look at the stimulus package, the one thing it has not done is stimulate. Uh, prior to the um, bailout money for the banks, the banks were lending a certain amount. After the bailout money, the banks were lending less. Uh, suppose, I mean, a stimulus means that he's not depending just on the government's own money being spent producing the result, that this will stimulate others in the economy. It is not. Money, uh, money, the circulation of money, the speed at which money circulates in the economy fell to the lowest level in 50 years. And I will say that that was the intent was to stimulate the economy, you know, for people to 
buy more, purchase more to stimulate. That's what a stimulus check is for, to stimulate the economy. But clearly it did not stimulate and banks were loaning less money. And I remember that. I remember all of that um, when Barack Obama was was president and, you know, bailing out the banks. It fell during the after the stimulus. Yes. Uh, business reduced its investment by oh, something like 25 or more percent. So that if you're looking in terms of what actually happens rather than the words that are used, uh, what actually has happened shows uh, no such stimulation as, they, as they're talking about. Barack Obama, during the same debate, if a woman is out there trying to raise a family, trying to support her family and is be being treated unfairly, then the court has to stand up if nobody else will. And that's the kind of judge I want. That's Close unconstrained. Quote. That somehow or other there are people with, 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 with the judicial robes on who can just decide these things ad hoc, which among other things would mean we would no longer really have law. Uh, you would discover once you got into the courtroom in front of the judge, you would then discover what the decision is, but you'd have no clue beforehand. So that would, a full embrace of the unconstrained vision, which Barack Obama seems intent on, mm. would overturn the fundamental basis of American law, which is a nation of laws, not of men. It Absolutely. would be a nation of, law, of men, of judges. Yes. All right. Uh, September of this year, the Rasmussen Polling Company asked this question. Should the Supreme Court make decisions based on what's written in the Constitution and legal precedents, or should it be guided mostly by a sense of fairness and justice? Close quote. 82% of McCain supporters said the Supreme Court should base its decisions on the Constitution. 29% of Obama supporters agree. 11% of McCain supporters said the Supreme Court should make its decisions on fairness. 49% of Obama supporters said that it should. Now, here's the question. You've, you've said... McCain constrained, Obama unconstrained. But what this would seem to indicate is polling data that this is not just a debate taking place among politicians or American elites. It's reached very deep into the American public. Oh, absolutely. 49% of Americans think the Supreme well, Court should... Of, of Obama supporters. For, excuse me, 49% of Obama supporters, exactly. Say the, so does that startle you? Does it alarm you? It, it doesn't startle me. It depresses me. But, uh, you know, this has been going on for a long time. People complain about a court decision on the basis that uh, that, that they wish it had turned out differently. But uh, that, that isn't the judge's job. Uh, I, there was a wonderful case. I wish I could remember the title of it, but, which Clarence Thomas uh, said that uh, he really agreed with the, the position taken by one of the litigants in the case, but that he wasn't there to decide that issue. He was there to decide what, what did the law say? And the law said otherwise, and so he voted against them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see the same thing in Oliver Wendell Holmes, where in a number of cases, uh, he, he makes very cutting uh, disparagements of one of the litigants in the case, and then votes in favor of him. Because he says, I'm not here to decide mm -hmm. what the merit is. And one of, his, one of his decisions, he said, I am not at liberty to, to discuss the, the justice of the act. The act is what it is, and once I know what that is, that's that's the decision that I have to make. Well, then, if you see, uh, well, one. And I say <laughs> it should be done by the Constitution, because when you get into was fair and justice, you know, you can get into a lot of different nuances that can go a lot of different ways. And the Constitution, you know, this is just my personal belief, is that it should be done that way. And I would, I agree with what Supreme Court Justice Thomas did, going by the Constitution, going by the law. Because when you don't go by the law, you get a lot of things that you should not be getting, you know, because fairness and justice can is relative on who it is making that decision. And with the constitution, if you go on by the law, it's more concrete. You have something standard, you know, to go by. And I feel like in the end, that ultimately becomes the most fair. One more question here. The un you write the unconstrained vision, again, I'm quoting you, has tended historically toward creating more equalized economic and social conditions in society even if the means chosen implied great 
inequality in the right to decide such issues and choose such means, close quote. Inequality in the right to decide issues. Does that tell us why the left in the United States seems so much more comfortable with having courts make social policy? Oh, absolutely. That's what's going on. A a absolutely. That, uh, the, that they, they want equality of outcomes and they will choose how to make the outcomes equal. But they don't want uh, uh, equality of choice on the part of the people themselves. Uh, many many of, uh, of the liberals say that they're for the family because they're for creating all kinds of goodies to give to families, but they want to take away the family's fundamental function, which is making decisions uh, for members of the, of the family itself, particularly the younger members who aren't yet grown. Obama has an absolute talent for saying things that make no sense, but not only sound plausible, but inspiring. You know, we're subsidizing the oil companies when they deduct the cost of doing business you know, in order to arrive at the figure of how much net income they have. Everybody does that. Right. So this notion, though, that, that if, you, if you're rich, you ought to pay more. Straightforward enough, no? It is straightforward to us. It's also straightforward nonsense. Why is that? Um, people don't, but they often speak of people who are rich as people who happen to have money. Right. Extremely few people happen to have money. There aren't that many Rockefellers. Well, but Rockefeller didn't happen to have money. But his heirs happen to have it. His heirs happen right. to have money. So you're doing But, his, but right. Rock, Rock, Rockefeller, he, Rockefeller reduced the coil, cost of oil to a fraction of what it had been before him, right. benefiting millions of people across the country. Therefore, they bought their oil from Rockefeller rather than from people who had more expensive ways of producing oil, one of them being the, the use of uh, tank cars on the railroads. The progressives were, were livid that Rockefeller uh, could ship his oil at a cheaper price than the other producers. It never occurred to them that oil, uh, Rockefeller shipped his oil in tank cars which are a hell of a lot cheaper to transport than in barrels. Right. I mean, we still measure oil in barrels today, but we ship it in tankers. Right. And uh, that's how he became a, a multi-billionaire. So we know from the study of economic history that wealthy people get wealthy by creating jobs, lowering prices of, yes. of, of products rather than Bill Gates, the richest man in America, one of the richest men in the world, invented an, invented an entire industry that yes. simply didn't. All right. We know all that, and we also know, as we mentioned earlier, that cutting taxes worked to spur economic growth in the 20s, again under John Kennedy in the 60s. Actually, the, it was Johnson who ended up, most of the tax cuts took place, let's call it under the 60s, and then again in Ronald, Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And then George W. Bush. And George W. Bush. So how is it that he can stand there in the face of this overwhelming evidence and be taken seriously. I'm not asking now about Barack Obama as an intellectual. I'm asking about the people listening to him. The, that's the question of the hour. You have people who uh, don't stop and think. You've had dumbed down education. You've had propagandistic education. And people, he's, what he's saying connects with all those, with all those kinds of things. All right. uh, in fact, it goes the other way too. I was just doing some research on Detroit and its decline. And they kept raising the city income tax. And every time they raised the tax rate, the tax revenues went down. Uh, in, in 2008, uh, Charles Gibson put this to, to Obama when he was a candidate. He said, why are you for raising the tax rate on the rich? Because uh, you often get more revenue at lower tax rates than at the higher tax rates. And he said, well, it's a question of social justice. In other words, he doesn't really care about whether the government raises more revenues. If he can get people mad at the rich and they vote for him, then, the, then it's a success. Just as uh, Coleman Young's policies in Detroit were a great political success for him. Mm. It ruined Detroit, but it, ruined it didn't. Detroit. I just have, uh, you and I happen to be reading on a similar subject from 1950. And I wanted to just add also that, you know, of course, with the whole tax talk right here. Um, lowering taxes raises revenue. And of course, Thomas Sowell brought up the fact that Obama wanted people to get excited about, you know, well, excited about being mad at the rich, make them pay more. Yeah, that's right. They make more, they pay more. But it doesn't really help raise revenue when you do that. 
statistically, that is what has been shown, according to Thomas Sowell. And one thing I noticed about Obama, he did a lot of dividing, a lot of division, like the make the rich pay more. That was a, a subtle way of division. And with all the other things that happened in the media during Obama's presidency, there was a lot more so during his presidency than I recognized during any other recent presidency. I haven't seen it as much with the, you know, BLM, of course, came out during Obama's presidency with the, you know, after Trayvon Martin and Zimmerman and all the other cases with Mike Brown and all the other situations that happened. There was a lot of division under Obama's presidency. And this is something that I noticed. And you guys can tell me what you think about what I'm about to say. It seems like, and this is getting a little spiritual right now, okay? Work with me. It seems like whatever's going on with the president himself, on a spiritual note, that whatever's going on, it carries down into what ends up happening out in the country. Because I noticed that with Obama, he was a, he's a, I did another video on, Thomas Sowell talking about Obama, that Obama was a community organizer and he did a lot of dividing. That's what they do. They divide. And what he did during the Obama presidency was divide. He was about dividing people. And he never said a lot of unif unifying speeches. And it can be up for interpretation. You know, you know, he said if Trayvon Martin was, if he had a son, he would look a lot like Trayvon. And a lot of people considered that divisive. I noticed that with you know, President Biden, the current president, that, you know, it's been said that, I don't want to say <laughs> the P word for a person who is, is interested in younger people, um, that that is something he has or deals with. And under him, you know, you got this talk of that very same thing, the P word, I don't want to say it, of it becoming an orientation that is protected like other sexual orientations. And that's interesting to me because I don't, I never want to believe something like that, but it seems to be happening. You know, the talk of it is being brought out into the forefront is, is just being talked about and mentioned so much in various channels on YouTube and everywhere else. So What's going on with the president? You know, you're going to see it in laws and everything else. So it's very important, extremely important. We're careful on how we vote because a lot of people think it doesn't matter, but it does matter. 50 to the present, two things happened. One was that the population of the United States of America roughly doubled. Mm. And the other was that the population of Detroit fell by roughly half. Yeah. Unbelievable. All right. Barack Obama in August of last year, quote, in the first 100 days of my administration, I will travel to a major Islamic forum and deliver an address to redefine our struggle. I will make clear that we will stand with those who are willing to stand up for their future and that we need their efforts to defeat the prophets of hate and violence, close quote. What do you make of those two? I think Barack Obama has a lot more faith in uh, in, uh, in, in verbal uh, uh, interactions than than, uh, than I would. What he's proposing under the guise of of change is what was what has been tried for decade for two decades between the two world war wars and which failed disastrously in helping to bring on the second world war. Barack Obama's plan for defense spending as of last year. Quoting, I'm quoting him, quoting his speech. I'll stop spending $9 billion a month in Iraq. I will cut tens of billions in wasteful spending. I will cut investments in unproven missile defense systems. I will not weaponize space. I will slow our development of future combat systems. And I will institute an independent defense priorities board to avoid unnecessary spending, close quote. Well, that, that's straight out of the 30s. There were people who were saying Britain should not push. The, the British Labour Party in the, in the early to mid 30s voted consistently against defense spending. And they argued that uh, our security does not allow, uh, does not uh, depend on armaments, but on disarmaments. And so when, when, uh, when Chamberlain went to uh, Munich to talk to Hitler, it wasn't just the, his own party, the conservatives who applauded him when he came back. It was, it was the uh, uh, Labour and liberals as well. 
he was he was probably the most lionized man among Western leaders, perhaps of the past century. You mentioned the, uh, I think you would call it a naive view of world affairs that he, he places a great deal of faith in a kind of, in rhetoric, the ability of rhetoric to solve global problems. This reminds you of the 1930s. It reminds you of Neville Chamberlain. Yeah. Uh, I read you a quotation of the notion of spreading the wealth around. And again, you said that's perfectly pure socialist doctrine mm -hmm. from the 1930s. Is it, would you argue that this man is the most left wing or the, uh, the purest embrace of the unconstrained vision that we've seen in American politics since, since when? Since the New Deal? Since, since the there's society? been American politics. Really? Yes. Yes. I mean, even FDR, uh, you know, pulled back on some things. But uh, uh, Obama, uh, really, he, he, he does have the unconstrained vision, which is really an elitist vision. It says, I know what is the best to be done, and I will do it. Uh, when he says, I will change the world, you realize this is a man who has actually accomplished nothing other than advancing his career through rhetoric. And, and he, it reminds me of, of a sophomore uh, in college, you know, who thinks that he can run the world because he's never had to run anything. And you can believe that only until you have uh, personal responsibility for consequences. And that's when it gives you a little bit of, uh, of humility. Why don't the American people see through that? Isn't that the fundamental bet that the founders made? That, the cons um, that, that voters would see through, ultimately they'd see through nonsense? Yes, but that, that, that was before nonsense became a, a large part of the curriculum of uh, our educational institutions. I was talking about this with a colleague of ours the other day, Tom McCurdy, who's an economist here at the Hoover Institution. And Tom said, well, remember what happened when Bill Clinton became president. <clears throat> His point is the American people are about to get an extreme illustration of the way government intervention messes things up. Hmm. Bill Clinton offered only a mild illustration. And yet even under Bill Clinton, it was only two years before Republicans, before there was enough of a backlash response that Republicans took both houses of uh, Congress away and, and, and the man was boxed in from that point forward. That's a pretty optimistic reading of what might happen. In fact, very it's about optimistic. very optimistic. Yes, because uh, uh, there, are, there, there is such a thing as a point of no return. Uh, and if, if, and, and if, in those, if in those two first two years, Iran gets nuclear weapons, we will be at that point of no return. And the, the next generation will live under that same threat and as far out as the eye can see. And so sometimes people who get who are very clever say it's just as well to let these guys get in there and discredit right, themselves. Right, right. Then we'll win on the backlash. People said that when Hitler was arising in uh, Germany, and many of those people who said that died in the concentration camps. Uh, so, uh, uh, which which is a smaller tragedy than a nation dying in a sense. Before the primaries had ended, you wrote Hillary Clinton versus John McCain. I wouldn't know whether to vote Libertarian or move to Australia. <laughs> now we know it's Barack Obama versus John McCain. You'll vote for John McCain, but hold your nose. What is your what's your fundamental? Yes, I, the, the difference is that the the, Clint, the Clintons had the uh, saving grace uh, uh, of uh, utter lack of principle, which meant that when 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 they saw which way the political winds were, were blowing, uh, that's the way they'd go, regardless of what they'd been saying before. That is so true. That is so. True. I remember, you know, the Clinton presidency and no, <laughs> they would say whatever, depending on who's in the room. It didn't matter. They would never stick. They never really had a steadfast principle. And, and, you know, you can say that of all politicians, to be honest with you. You know, they'll say what they have to to get the votes. I get all of that. But it was it's just more blatantly obvious with some politicians than it is with others. And going back to what Barack Obama said, Barack Obama, and this is, of course, is an old interview. This is when Obama was running the first time. And it still applies because a lot of people, you, you're going to ask me, why are you doing this old interview with Thomas Sowell? Well, it's still relevant. You know, some of you believe that Barack Obama is in his third term anyway, and that, you know, Biden is just up there as the face but Barack Obama is running the show. And so the whole thing with the flowery language, redefine our struggle. You know, if you really listen hard to what he's saying, hope and change, redefine our struggle and change the world. I mean, 
you most people aren't going to be a privy to what he really means by his saying change the world, hope and change and redefine. Those words are exactly what describes Barack Obama. Exactly. And he did those things. We now have same sex marriage because uh, up under his presidency, we never had that before, but we have it now. And now with Biden is continuation of Obama, if you ask me, because now it's a whole lot of transgenderism that children are allowed to change their so-called gender, even at very young ages, and is looked at as child abuse if a parent does not allow their child to go and so-called change their gender to how they identify. The world that we live in is not going in the right direction. This country is not going in the right direction. And it's been going the wrong direction way before Barack Obama was even born. But because of the situation that we were already in, it allowed for Barack Obama to exist and to be elected for a second term. So you guys give me your comments about that. You know, everything about Barack Obama was made to sound so inspirational and it just was you know, but I didn't fall for it. I didn't vote for him either time. I was one of the 2% of African-Americans that did not vote for the man. You know, God told me he was evil. The, the spirit of God, I know y'all gonna say, yeah, 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 you just got self-hate. You did support a black man. That's not true. I look at something beyond skin. I don't just focus on the skin color. Uh, this man has been a far left ideologue for 20 years. And I, by, and not just uh, a matter of ideology. I mean, people who are truly vile people. We're not talking about just people who have a certain theory. Bill Ayers. The Bill Ayers. I mean, Acorn. I'm talking thuggery as the way to get your ideas across. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Father Flagel. You know, you go to go down the list. Uh, and uh, I, I judge people by what they've done, not by what they say. Particularly when what they say is the direct opposite of what they've done. So that uh, I know, I think this man really does believe that he that he can change the world, uh, and people like that are infinitely more dangerous than mere uh, crooked politicians. If the current polls hold, the Wall Street Journal, I'm quoting the Wall Street Journal now, declared in an editorial last week. Barack Obama will win the White House on November 4th, and Democrats will consolidate their congressional majorities. Though we doubt most Americans realize it, the journal continues, this would be one of the most profound political and ideological shifts in U.S. history, close quote. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, 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 and the repercussions extend, uh, the, the fact that they were made, will create disasters in the economy, I think will appeal by comparison to what they will do in terms of uh, countries acquiring nuclear weapons and turning those over to terrorists. Which is the point of no return once that happens. Right, right. Do you, I was talking about this with- I gotta a, say, I gotta say this, I gotta say this. He, he said, Thomas Sowell said, you know, nuclear weapons turned them over to terrorists. You guys may remember Benghazi, there was like a weapons shipment being made, weapons, um, war weapons being made and it, four Americans ended up being killed because there was a cover up to try and hide what was going on with those weapons. And Hillary, Hillary was behind that. And Barack Obama, you know, and Susan Rice covered for her. And some, you know, of course, she's a Democrat. She's not in prison, you know. And gosh, and the whole thing with Iran, all the money that was paid to free you know, the prisoners, you know, Trump said he would be able to do it without paying them all that money. That really helped Iran, y'all. Maybe there was that maybe he felt like that was the only way he could fix the situation. Maybe that that's what Barack, Barack Obama felt like he had to do. But Trump said he would have done it better. You know, people can always say they could do something better till they're in that situation. But that was a lot that went wrong there with terrorist organizations, terror countries that 
prey on terror. A colleague of ours the other day, Tom McCurdy, who's an economist here at the Hoover Institution, and Tom said, well, remember what happened when Bill Clinton became president. <clears throat> His point is the American people are about to get an extreme illustration of the way government intervention messes things up. Mm. Bill Clinton offered only a mild illustration, and yet even under Bill Clinton, it was only two years before Republicans, before there was enough of a backlash response that Republicans took both houses of uh, Congress away and, and, and the man was boxed in from that point forward. That's a pretty optimistic reading of what might happen. In fact, very it's about optimistic. Very optimistic? Yes, because uh, uh, there, are, there, there is such a thing as a point of no return. Uh, and if, if and, and if in those if in those two first two years Iran gets nuclear weapons, we will be at that point of no return, and the, the next generation will live under that same threat and as far out as the eye can see. And so sometimes people who get who are very clever say it's just as well to let these guys get in there and discredit right, themselves. Right, right. Then we'll win on the backlash. People said that when Hitler was arising in uh, Germany, and many of those people who said that died in the concentration camps. Uh, so. Uh, uh, which, which is a smaller tragedy than a nation dying in a sense. Before the primaries had ended, you wrote, Hillary Clinton versus John McCain. I wouldn't know whether to vote libertarian or move to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> now we know it's Barack Obama versus John McCain. You'll vote for John McCain, but hold your nose. What is your, what's your fun? Yes, I, the, the difference is. Okay, that's a repeat there. You guys. Just give me your comments because I was just sitting there thinking again about the Iran deal that Barack Obama made. And that deal was supposed to stop Iran from making nuclear weapons for, I believe, 10 years. But then they went ahead and went back to nuclear arms, nuclear weapons. They went back to doing the thing that they wanted to do in Iran. So it was for a short time. It was supposedly made to look like a good thing. And then I already mentioned about all the money to free the prisoners that was given to Iran. Terrorists. Oh, goodness. And I sometimes wonder now, And again, you know, a lot of people believe, and I believe this too, that Barack Obama is in his third term. He was already, you know, over in the UK meeting with the prime minister a couple of weeks ago, talking about, Whatever I was, you know, I read it was AI, artificial intelligence, but it could have been a lot of other things. Things are being set up in this country right now. And it's about to get, I feel, not saying I'm a prophet or anything, I feel that it's going to be going to get very, very scary. Very scary. And those of us who are Christians, we got to stay prayed up. We have got to stay prayed up. We've got to warn our family, our friends, as many people who will listen to us, stay on our face. It's, it's rough times. It's rough times. It really is. And I'm concerned about what's going to happen, you know, as 2024, as we get further and further into this year. You know, with this being an election year, with everything that's going on with Donald Trump and and, you know, what they're trying to do to him, to destroy him. And from my point of view, from my vantage point, I look at him as someone who wants to do right by the country. I'm not saying he's perfect, but there's a reason why they are trying to take him out. They can't be, you know, some of the comments are sometimes he's just like the other ones. That they're two sides of the same coin. Not That's when you're talking about rhino Republicans. There are some Republicans and Donald Trump is one of them. And there are a few others. I call them MAGA Republicans that are for the country. That's my belief. Because why are they going after him like that? They never went after the other Republicans like that. They never did. They never did. This man, they are trying to break him spiritually, mentally, financially, physically. They're trying to break him. But you know what? Truth Social is doing well. It went public. It's on the stock market. That's right. If y'all want to buy y'all some shares, <laughs> go ahead. But um, that's all I have for today. You guys give me your comments. I just don't believe that they're all on the same team. I have a friend who believes that, you know, Trump and the Democrats and all of them are the same team. I just don't see that. You guys give me your thoughts. Give me your comments. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe to my channel. I am on my way to 20,000 subscribers by the end of April. You guys have been a blessing to me. 
And I want you guys to have a blessed day. Remember to stay prayed up. And as I always say, march on, warriors. <laughs>